My name's Mike Sharp. I'm the uh, founding partner and creative director of a London-based studio called Found. Um, we've been going for about 11 years now, meandering our way through film and motion design. And uh, we've seen a lot of changes, in particular in the last couple of years. And that's the centerpiece of the talk today, uh, about how things have moved on uh, in the world of motion design uh, over the past 10 years, but in particularly the last couple. Um, Thank you, first of all, for Maxon for having us as well, because uh, we've been, I've been using it since 2003 um, when I, I got the, the software for, a, uh, I was running the design department of a DVD production studio and uh, we needed to move beyond After Effects. We needed to make 3D logos and text. So we went and got uh, this software, tried it out, thought it would be great for us and everybody scoffed and said it sh we should be getting Lightwave or Soft Image. And I said, we just need to do 3D logos. So it seemed perfect and integrated well with After Effects. So we, we got that. And things have moved on since those 3D uh, logos and text. Let's take you through, through a few things. Um, it should be playing. So look, go, going back uh, to the beginning, uh, just to give you a bit of context, uh, first of all. My background, um, I'm a creative director, so you're not going to be getting a tech demo from me today, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, but I will show you a little bit about inside the studio and also, as I say, the journey we've been on to get to where we are today. So my background is uh, in graphic design. I went to college in Camberwell in South London, graduated in 2000. Uh, I wanted to do live action. I wanted to be a director. I wanted to do music videos. So I became a runner. I was trying to desperately get directing work. Um, and at the time, there was a huge shift going on in the industry in that world. There were digital video cameras came out and big name directors were happy to pick them up uh, for music videos and also feature films the likes of Danny Boyle, 28 Days Later, TV shows like Trigger Happy TV. Um, it was okay to have this lower grade look um, as long as you were doing something interesting in it with the editing uh, or perhaps a little bit of motion graphics. Um, so this really inspired me and, and, and when I was a runner in Soho there was a lot of conversations in the pubs around there where editors were freaking out because no one was using Avid so much, they, all this desktop software was coming out. It's like, people can just do this in their bedroom, Wh what's going on? Uh, but it was really, really inspirational. However, my real, real heroes at the time were these guys. Check this out, we're in the creative home of the guys from Shinola. I'm Jason, uh, I'm in Shinola. Hi, my name's Gideon, I'm from Shinola. Hi, I'm Chris. Same. <laughs> Hello. This is a kind of a, a neat setup. I mean, you all live together and you all work together. This is where I work. It, it looks a mess, but uh, actually it's a, a very complicated filing system. Hey, as we come in, how many hours a day do you spend in here? Uh, about, about 25. <laughs> Guns blazing for uncle. Quanum. I changed my mind, I changed my mind. Morgan. Dreaming Steve Malmus. Kid A Blips for Radiohead. <laughs> Pyramid Song for Radiohead. Everything we do is just to amuse ourselves and and half the time you just I think we, like when we we're making Pyramid Song. I wake up some days and think, I can't believe I'm making this pop video from my bedroom. These guys were making this stuff from their bedroom. So it, it was hugely inspirational for someone like myself who could pick up a video camera, could get desktop software and start making stuff without the need for expensive uh, crews, locations, uh, even editing facilities. You just get out there and do it. And there was no real excuses, which is incredibly daunting as well, um, but hugely inspirational. So that's how Found was started. It was, uh, let's set up a studio. There's no reason not to. Let's get the, the hardware, let's get the software, and let's start making stuff. Um, and we collaborated with a lot of people at the time. It was just me and a friend. Had freelancers in a lot. Uh, and we grew it all from there. And I think just starting the talk with that sort of uh, sentimentality is important because we've still got that spirit at Found where if we want to try things, we do it. And... Um, uh, it's that slightly sort of DIY spirit. Uh, um, okay, so before we go into the work, I just want to talk a little bit about just setting the scene a bit more. There's a lot of talk about um, what's the difference between visual effects and motion design because the boundaries are becoming quite blurry at the moment. 
thanks to all the brilliant people that make the software and all the plugins and things that we need. So just looking around in preparation for the talk, I thought I'd Google what is visual effects. And uh, it's fairly well documented. You know, you can look around and there's everybody's got their interpretation of what visual effects is, but it's pretty much agreed. It involves the integration of live action and generated imagery, enabling us yes, to create environments and inanimate objects, animals or creatures and that look completely realistic, that would also be dangerous, expensive, impractical, time-consuming or impossible to capture on film. And you won't be able to tell it apart from real life. That's what visual effects is. So it's supposed to not be seen. It's supposed to be invisible. You can't tell it's visual effects. That's what a lot of people always say. You can't tell it's visual effects. Conversely, you look around at what is motion design, and there's not an awful lot of explanation about what actually motion design is right now. Um, we know that it derived from the term motion graphic design, and it encompasses those three things of motion, graphics, and design. Um, much like visual effects, it does uh, involve the discipline of, in of incorporating graphic design with live action. But the crucial difference is it's supposed to be seen. You're supposed to be seeing these graphics. They're supposed to be front and center. And they're not hidden as a visual effect. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd show you sort of a slightly cringing moment where I show you a show of my own from almost 10, 15 years ago. The sort of things we were doing uh, when we picked up Cinema 4D. We, we were still in After Effects and we were going 2.5D and then a little bit of 3D text or windows that you could put video through like this. I was working on a lot, a lot of DVD uh, design and uh, music commercials and things like that, which at the time, 10, 15 years ago, was pretty cool and there were some uh, interesting things going on. But things have moved and surpassed that quite phenomenally. Um, where we're now in this sort of world, the most incredible stuff that's being created. And though again, those boundaries between visual effects are becoming very, very blurry indeed. If we go back over that visual effects checklist, what is motion design? Well, we are creating environments, we're creating inanimate objects, we're creating animals or creatures, and they look completely realistic. That would probably be dangerous, expensive, impractical, time consuming, or impossible to capture on film. So there's a real advantage to doing it in motion design and you won't be able to tell them apart from real life, but they are still intended to be seen. We're not saying this is visual effects, because it's very much celebrating the fact that it is CGI, but all the textures and the lighting and everything is real looking. This is why you're seeing a lot of visual effects studios setting up motion design studios, um, because the two things go so well together, which means there's an incredible competition at the moment a very healthy competition that's pushing things forward, I would say, weekly, daily, uh, and creating a huge community of things online where you can find resources, share tutorials, and the tools and the talent are, is just getting better exponentially every day, which is very, very exciting. Here's a little quote from Stash at the end of last year where they said, the explosion of visual experimentation caused by the continued democratization of 3D animation and rendering tools is arguably the most exciting trend of this decade. And I'd stand wholeheartedly behind that in the 11-year in the journey we've had and 15 years that I've been working in motion. Right now is probably the most exciting thing going on. There's another revolution going on, the same way we saw it with editing software before, we're seeing it now with 3D uh, rendering and motion. So there's a little setup before we go into more detail. A little bit about uh, Cinema 4D uh, and how we use it at Found. I refer to, refer to it as the engine of the studio because, um, as I said, when we first were using the software, we just thought of it as 3D text and a few objects here and there. Um, so it was on the periphery and After Effects was still our, our animation tool. And over the last 10 years, and particularly the last 18 months, two years, it has very much become at the forefront of everything we do in the studio. No matter if we're using Houdini as well, or other things like X Particles, and Substance Designer, Marvelous Designer, whatever it is, these things all bolt on into Cinema 4D in a brilliant way. Um, so it's very much the engine and the driving force of every project we do now. Um, so ways that we use Cinema. Um, modeling, we're seeing a lot more product films. This was something we did for Hive and it was about two years ago now. And it, for me, this was the wake up moment when I saw the stuff that was being created 
uh, whereas before it would be informational films in After Effects. Now the information films are actually like product films and they look photo real and the client is seeing their products presented in a really realistic but in a super sexy way and that's hugely valuable for them. I didn't know we could do this so I turn around and I see the guys are rendering the stuff and I'm like wow it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, that led on to mobile phone handsets that we have been modeling, uh, drinks cans that we model, we're using X particles to create uh, uh, condensation, alcohol brands as well should be releasing this, this f these suite of films we've made fairly shortly. They let us put a few stills up. These are all completely CGI. Everything I'm showing here is completely CG made in Cinema 4D. Even cars. We did a TV commercial for this company, Drover, recently. We didn't model the cars. They're widely available on the internet, but you can buy them and texture them and light them, use them in your spots and commercials. Look completely photoreal. This one was actually discussed as being a live action shoot at one point. But if you think about the 25 different car makes and models and colors that you'd have to change them to in post to shoot them on set, you know, it's weeks of work. So you do it in CG. Something that I think probably gets overlooked but is a huge backbone to the studio is previs and planning. Um, cinema's great at, at, at doing that. We did an in-store thing for Nissan out in um, Paris and we designed all the content for these huge screens that were um, at 6K and they went from the back of the store all the way across the top and out through the front facer of the store. But to get a real sense of how they might look and how they might reflect on the cars, we, we'll chuck that into cinema as well. Even though the content was also made in cinema, actually pre-visualizing how that might look, it's a useful thing to do. We come from a live action background, so we're still directing, we're storyboarding, we're using animatics to get those signed off by the clients. So everything we do in, in terms of storytelling gets storyboarded and, 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 and done as a previs. This is something we just released, which was the title sequence for the um, FIBA uh, Basketball World Cup that's going on at the moment in China. Created the opening su title sequence. I'll just play you this. So it's a great way after your storyboarding, obviously, to take it into cinema. Just block it out with crew, grayscale stuff. Start thinking about your cameras, how things are going to move, how long shots need to be timed for. Again, coming from a live action background, we still find ourselves sitting in the studio talking about what lens have you got on the camera? Is it a 50 mil or 80 mil? What's the shutter angle? What's the depth of field? Are we tracking? Are we panning? Are we jibbing? Are we tilting? Are we talking about camera moves? We're just doing it inside the computer. Also, we've done quite a bit of projection mapping now. It's not so much uh, uh, in trend as much as it was a few years ago, but we did quite a lot of it, and it's so useful to go and plan out stuff for a big shoot like this. This is for Fujitsu, and what you're seeing here is the animatic in the top left, but it's more than just an animatic. It's actually telling us exactly where the camera has to be, and from that animatic, we uh, had a shooting bible of the, uh, I think, 19 projection map shots that we had to shoot in three days in the studio. Um, and it told us what lens the camera was Gathering using, told us what height the camera was at, what position it was in, inside of this cube that we were projecting it in. Um, and the camera had to sit in that sweet spot for it to look right, because with projection mapping, if, if you don't know, it's about distorting it. Uh, if it hits the back walls, then it's distorting it so that it looks correct from the, f from the point of view of the camera. So it's giving us a shooting bible but it's also then that's how we create the content the content has to be created from that sweet spot with a little bit of bleed and then the camera frames up just inside of that so impossible really to do a job like this without using cinema to plan it all out and in the left here top left anything that's red was color coded as is, is live action they're going to be stood on the set so this section here there's not any live uh, any actors or anything we're just projecting content into the cube here and then as the camera pans around at the end there's live action people standing there so it's a way of denoting what is going to be projected and what is going to be actually there as a prop or an actor for real. In a similar vein we've done motion control shoots um, and it's, it's interesting when you get a, a schedule from a, a client or an agency on something like this it still has that more traditional schedule with a big back end of post-production Whereas we actually spent a long time in pre-production, six weeks to make this animatic up the top left, which just seems crazy when it's so crude, but it's actually all our editing process is done in there. You know, you, you're, you're signing off exactly what the shot is, how it's going to move, how the actors are going to move. Um, 
the timing of everything and that went through a lot of rounds of approvals and changes until we're all happy with that and then those cinema 4d cameras are the camera data is exported out and imported into the milo rig on set and then this is the final film that we created here so we're using cinema like that as well to create motion design driven camera moves that can be actually done live on set so those it's nice having that symbiotic relationship one enforcing the other sometimes the other way around as well it's the we also do do some visual effects although we don't class ourselves as a visual effects studio or facility but sometimes the job requires a bit of visual effects so something we did for peroni here one of the ideas were, um, to illustrate the idea that the Peroni flavor was perfectly balanced, we were going to have this impossible stack of chairs, which would have been way uh, outside the budget to production design that. So we said, that's fine, we can create that in CG. So we took a few reference photographs of uh, a couple of chairs on set and rebuilt them and then composited them in like that. A studio film we did a year or so ago, um, pushing the boundaries a little bit further, trying to make photorealistic flowers. That was quite a big challenge. This was um, done in Redshift um, with one of the guys from the studio, and that was uh, a, a good tryout of that. Um, some amazing results. Again, I didn't know we could really do stuff like this, you know, with the tools that we had and the talent that we have. It's incredible. And then the final thing that we're, sort of we're doing now much more recently is actually fully CGI films. Um, I showed some of the product stuff earlier, but those films are fully CGI. We just released something uh, last week, I think, for the US clothing label Everlane. The great project um, to illustrate all their testing that all their fabrics and clothing goes through. Um, we designed a whole load of uh, robots that test all the fabrics, and we're using all the toolkit that we have to create photorealistic fabrics and robots testing the material. Uh, we've done promos for Viasat World where very stylized, but um, again, photoreal rendering of statues exploding and anatomical sculptures and things submerged in water. The, the range of which of stuff that we can cover off with a suite is incredible. And then to more recent times, the project I'm gonna go through now uh, is this project uh, for Ballantine's, Ballantine's Whiskey. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen this online, but this was um, uh, probably the biggest thing we've ever done as a studio and, and the closest we've ever come to visual effects. It's a uh, fully CGI film, uh, two minutes, um, originally conceived as a live action film. Um, went in to see the agency uh, and they, they, they pitched it all to us as to what their vision was for the film and the each scene that they wanted. And then we discussed whether the parameters of doing it practically in live action and versus doing it in CGI and quite honestly there was nowhere near enough the budget to create this film in uh, live action uh, just for the locations and production design and visual effects that you would have needed um, was just beyond the scope of the budget conversely we knew that taking it on a, and saying yeah we'll do this two minute film entirely in cinema 4d and any other bolt-on tools and plugins we, c we use was also a tall order but we like a challenge. So we, we, we took this on. Um, we had to create big scenes of architecture, which we designed. Um, we were dealing with environments for high concept things. We were dealing with lots of natural elements as well. Water, fruit, heather, moss, all sorts of soft body stuff as well as hard. And crucially, four pretty serious pack shots as well, which as we know, can be the really difficult part of a project, getting a client's product to look perfect and it, it wasn't just a two-minute hero film it was also the job was to then take on all the imagery for the entire campaign um, which meant we were doing digital assets as well global travel retail stuff print as well at high res which I'll show you in a moment so I'll, um, I'll play the film it's two minutes long and then I'll take you through a breakdown of how we've done all the scenes in there For centuries, the ways of whiskey have been set in stone. The malts that make a blend stay unknown. Only five men have ever made our blend. The single malts that shape it have been tasted by nearly as few. 
Tradition says these malts should stay our secret. But at Ballantines, tradition guides us, never rules us. Because when something's exceptional, it should be shared. From lands veiled in mist, the hidden springs of the Blackburn River infuse Milton Duff with its flavour. Amidst the guarded secrets of Glenburgie Distillery, our founder discovered a single malt so perfectly balanced its recipe has remained unchanged for 200 years. And to this day, Glenburgie single malt is still fiercely guarded. Craft and passion passed down the generations. Every bottle of Glen Talkers made by the strength of hand-wielded tools crafting its flavour. While Valentine still keeps many secrets, some things are too good to hide. Everything in that two minute film, with the exception of the goose, uh, is completely generated in uh, CGI, which is a, a huge um, testament, I think, to not only us as a studio, but also the tools and everything that's available now, because to be able to make a film like that in, in, in for two minutes just wouldn't have been possible a few years ago. Um, certainly not for a studio of our size. Um, so I'll take you a little bit, I'll tell you, walk you through sort of how we create something like that because it's, it's quite a big process. We spent four months making that film um, and even longer when you consider all the digital assets and print campaign stuff we did as well. From the beginning, Cubo, the agency that we work with, uh, wrote a fantastic brief. We went in and met them. They showed us their vision for this, uh, this white world, that's this fictitious house of Ballatines and it's all about unlocking the secrets behind the blend. So what we were promoting here is three individual single malts that are normally contained within the Ballatines blend, but they were, the f they were releasing those as individual malts, and they wanted to celebrate each of those individually. The three single malts were Milton Duff, uh, which is uh, at the real distillery. They have this water wheel. It's uh, well known for being having a lot of scotch mist, a lot of natural elements and heather and moss, and this... Uh, ancient water source of the Blackburn River. So all these things needed to feature in the film. The second one, Glen Berge, uh, centers around a place called Customs House, this little cottage here, which is where one of the founders of Ballatines lived. So that was a very important element to the film and features in the packaging artwork. So we had to recreate that. And in the cellar of that house, there are lots and lots of ancient malts and secrets that he keeps hidden. Um, there was also flavor notes of honey, uh, and apple and citrus and pear. And the third and final one was Glen Talkers, which is one of the oldest manual distilleries in Scotland, still using hand-wielded tools. And they, they have this, uh, these pagoda chimneys, which are very central to, uh, to, um, to the distillery and the look of the distillery. Um, but it's this sense of hand-crafted. And, and th there's also these uh, flavour notes of black currants and raspberries and uh, more citrus. So... Once they've given us the download and all that and we've accepted the job, we then have to go through and figure out how we're going to turn all that into a film. And that's pretty standard. We go and figure out a storyboard, plan out all the shots. It, it had to work as cut downs as well. So this two minute film that you just saw actually had to cut down into three standalone 30 second films. So we devised a series of corridors and exits and entrances that we could then cut to any room we wanted to once we had to do the cut downs. But as we said previously, once this is all uh, approved and agreed in principle that we've got the scenes right in the right order and that we're telling the story in the correct way, we then do a guide VO and go and try it out in previs, much like we saw earlier. Um, so I'll just show you what the previs looked like of this project. Just turn this down a smidge. But again, just very quickly able to start to visualise how long each shot would be and you'll see that there's it's Centrist quite close to the final film in the top right hand corner but stuff. sometimes shots do vary in length. I Bolts think most of the shots are the same. There may be one extra blend. shot in the in the uh, final film that wasn't in the previous. I can't remember, but Only five it's a very good way of starting to go from obviously from your storyboard into your pre-visualizing the whole film and timing out everything. 
especially if you're working on strict timelines for TV commercials. But at Ballantines, tradition guides us. And you get a real sense for the film, even if it is crude. It should be shared. It's very helpful for clients, of course, to be able to see it in this, in this way. Lands veiled in mist, the hidden springs of the Blackburn River infuse. Because it wasn't until much later that we had all the models and the and the kit of parts we needed to actually assemble the film. We spent probably two months. We had an artist. Uh, um, we had six visual effects artists, most 3D motion design artists working on this. So not a huge team. So it took us a couple of months to get through all the stuff we needed to create to and start to assembling day, the scenes, but again the previs will tell us what's going to be in each shot and how much you're actually going to see, whether you need to model it very very high poly or whether you, you can get away with doing something in Substance Painter that gives it the, the illusion Craft of and geometry. Passed down the generations, every bottle of Glen Talkers made by the strength of hand-wielded tools crafting its flavour. We spent quite a long time on the previous. While all the modelling's going on, myself and our senior animator Ryan will be working on this previous a lot. Uh, and I suppose that's where my directing Some background comes in, and good start trying to work it out like a, like a film. So probably a good six weeks working on the previous back and forth with the client, while all the modelling's going on, uh, until that's approved. Um, so I walk you through some of the key scenes in the film, starting with the hallway. Uh, this is this is something that I perhaps think we, um, in general, the architecture in this film, we probably overlooked when we accepted the project. Just the amount of um, uh, work it would take to try and design uh, a building. We had to look around at a lot of references. How's the where's the light source coming from? Um, what's the design? The the client wanted it to have this blend because we're talking with a blended whiskey they wanted this blend between old and new and somewhere in the architecture they wanted the, they liked the idea that things were twisting a little bit the idea that things were blending together so we went just for the hallway we went through countless iterations of ideas w what looks well this went a bit tim burton at one point until we got the right sort of feel i think for uh, heritage and and modernity sort of blending together so modeling something like this as well, I think it's, it's easy to overlook that you're not just looking at the shot that you're looking through the camera. Um, what I mean by that is we had to conceive it outside of just the shot that you're looking at in the film because we wanted, uh, where's the, like I said before, where's the light gonna come from? How are we gonna move through this space? Where's the exit? Where's the entrance? Where's the next room? The tree room is next door. And we wanted there to be a correlation to each room that you go through in this journey. So this is where we ended up for this. Um, we had sort of very polished concrete floor, more modern walls, so perhaps a little bleached out on the screen, but then we had these girders that, that twisted together in this archway and a lattice roof and there's some woodwork up the top as well. So mixing our textures quite a lot um, to give us that sort of blend. And then towards the end, we put in these uh, benches, which small details like that still had to be designed, probably five or six different benches that we tried out and the lights. But they suddenly gave it a sense of scale. I think before that, they just, it just, you didn't really understand the registration of the room or how big it was. These sculptures at the end could, you know, they would be bigger, taller than I am, but you can't really tell that until you put a bench or something tangible in there. Um, so this is a little breakdown of how that ended up. And then the next scene was this tree room. The, 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 the the agency had written this idea that there would be a tree growing through the floor to sort of su in some way articulate the idea that the brand is, is 200 years old and that they maybe tr planted this tree and it's just grown and grown and grown, um, which is a f fabulous idea. We started looking around at references, of course, and we liked the idea that this tree maybe grew through the roof because it's been growing for so long, somebody then had to cut a hole in the ceiling to allow it to keep growing. Uh, we modeled a tree. Um, and we did this in with Speed Tree. We wanted it to look gnarly and old. That's what the client wanted. And then brought this into Cinema 4D. But texturing with Substance Painter, looking at tons of different references to try and make it look old. Had that moss on it. And all these kind of ridges and, like I say, being gnarly and old and twisted. Um, Use a little bit of Houdini to sort of figure out the ways of breaking up the floor as well. 
and how again what should the scale be like and then once we'd made the tree and we'd broken the floor we'd bring it back into cinema and then start to think about the overall room and what that might look like and we had some great ideas about a staircase twisting around the tree and the idea that if you were walking around this place you could walk up the staircase and look at the tree and then there'd be an atrium at the top and that'd be a really lovely idea and and then realized that actually the staircase is becoming the centerpiece to this shot and distracting really from what the pure visual is supposed to be an old tree so with with regret we took that one away um and as i said before it wasn't just about a tree in a room it's it's what else is going on how you know we didn't want to see the branches they they were sticking out of the the hole but we still had to make the branches. We still had to conceive a roof because that's our light source. That's going to create shadows all around the room. So again, not just looking at the shot that you're making, looking at a third party view and trying to conceive a world that's outside of your view. And a great deal of effort went into that, s that sort of stuff that you don't see to create dappled light on, on the wall here um, to give you a sense of this is a fully realized world and three dimensional world as you go up the staircase here. And here's a little breakdown of all the elements and passes that we used. This is something we do quite a lot, actually, is have, have a sort of like a little bit of poetic license with the sun, just traveling at breakneck speed to give you a bit of light play across the scene. Always helps create a bit of movement. Then on to the cask room. We, we really like the idea that if they were going in this order, that you'd been into the tree room and then you'd sink through the floor. And actually, the only time we would go all dark and moody, like most traditionally most whiskey brands do that, would be in the cask room. And that the, the roots of the tree would still be visible on the ceiling because you've gone down into the basement. We really like that idea. Um, we had to model lots and lots of uh, casks. Um, some more hero for close-up details, some less detailed geometry for uh, populating the scene. Originally, the client wanted it to be quite distressed in part, so you'd have pieces of barrels uh, broken up around the room. So we tried experiments with that. This is a shot from some of the concept art as well, because before it seems quite prescriptive when you've got a brief, but actually you start to try and describe the, the image to somebody, you realise you've got to get uh, do that in concept art. So we had a concept artist working on all these scenes, and this is uh, one of my favourite, even though it, it didn't go through it, it was too much like a warehouse, it was too tangibly close to how the barrels are actually kept, and um, we wanted it to be a lot more uh, interesting and, and hyper-real and designed than that. Another attempt was something like this, where it was too much like a sort of religious abbey or something, although there was something in that, there was something in the archways, it felt like there was a heritage to this. So we, we kept some of that, but then made the walls much more modern by looking at art gallery spaces, but then kept these cages for the special blends and things like that. And the tree was still visible up the top. That was always something we wanted to keep in vision. So the final sort of concept was something like this. Uh, added some lights. Again, trying to figure out where the light was coming from. Remember, we're coming from the tree room. So what was in the tree room? We were trying to figure out if we had to put light in there. It had to come down below the surface as well. Uh, and this is the final shot. On to the bottle room. Um, this was a very tricky scene to figure out. Um, the idea from the, from the client was that there would be this optical sculpture of hanging glass vials with lots of whiskey in them and that the camera would move around and it would line up at one point to form the, the outline of a, a whiskey bottle, which was very, very difficult to try and articulate and try and uh, make lots of questions to ask. Um, the first thing we did was just do, do some tests as to what the camera angle should be as well, a bit like projection mapping. If we decide later on that we want to put the camera at a low angle, make the bottle look proud and look up at it, that's going to mess up our entire sculpture. So we've got to get the camera angle sorted at the moment, uh, first thing. Um, so we just did that very crudely with some shapes. And these, I think, were all in the end just hung by hand from the viewpoint of the camera. Um, Again, stuff that you don't really notice in the film is that we did conceive it as a real sculpture. How would they be hung in the ceiling? So we create um, 
uh, created a system of, of sort of rigging up the top with high tension wires and cables and stuff and all this stuff was modelled and is up there it creates shadows and, and detail that probably isn't noticeable on first watch but adds to the believability the glass vials themselves went through a lot of rounds of thought and changes um, originally starting like this perhaps felt a little bit too much like jewels and jewellery and sapphires um, until we eventually realised that they should be a real thing that you could put liquid in. How did the liquid get in there? So we put a stopper in there. Um, again, starting to put the high tension wires in. And the final ones had a glass stopper. Tiny little bit of detail with the Ballantine's crest on the glass stopper. You'll see that in the film. All of that's got to be modelled. And how a lot of discussion about how that glass mould would actually be made in, in, real, in the real world. And then the final thing in this room was the five master blenders that have, uh, that have worked at Ballotines. And they wanted a little nod to that. But we didn't want to get bogged down into the actual facial details of every person that's had that job at Ballotines. They were only ever viewed to be viewed from a distance. So they could be quite small. So we could get away with that. So we used Adobe Fuse to get these royalty-free figures. Then we could pose them how we wanted them, remodel them, retexture them in Substance Painter. And then bring them back in here and put things in their hands and pose them in these ways and I think they're really successful when you see them in the final shot just they add something to the scene that they're all standing around the shrine to the whiskey and by this point we've already made rooms we've m the hallway was the hardest hump to get over once we designed that initial shot initial shot at the beginning of the film we had things that we could then recycle into all the other rooms the girders the concrete the textures that we've made can now be just applied in here so there's a design rationale throughout the throughout the house of ballatines none more so i think than in the atrium which was the final sort of room before you get into the actual single malts. The idea was that you'd have this cloud and it was to do with um, weather. You know, making whiskey is a, is a lot to do with the location and in Scotland it rains a lot and um, they wanted a nod to that with the cloud. So we looked around and, and we tried a lot of designs for this. Uh, initially, huge amphitheatre type scales, perhaps a lake would be collecting all the waters from the, from the cloud that had where the rainfall had collected in a, in a, in a lake. <coughs> this very much had that blended feel to it until we ended up with the, the final design, something like this, with some seating, the idea that perhaps people might sit down and sit under the cloud, much like an installation at the Tate Modern or something. And then all the doors represent the different secret blends that go into the Ballotines, and you'll see three of the doors are open. They are the three single malts that we're then going to go and take a look at. So the first of the single malts was Milton Duff, if you remember. Um, and this uh, had a lot of flora and fauna, a lot of um, heather and moss, mist, and of course the water wheel that we had to create. So from a photograph, we modeled this. And we did that with quite simple geometry. You can see there, it's just a very basic geometry. But then by texturing it in the right way, you give it the impression that it's got much more high detailed geometry than it actually has um, and that all depends on how you're going to use the shot in the end it gives the impression that it might be slightly wet we're grabbing textures from texture libraries and forester to create all the flora and flora and rocks and moss we're doing some houdini sins for the uh, blackburn river again and bringing all of that back into cinema to create the final scene And this is one of our first pack shots that we had to do as well. So all of this, everything in here is modelled here in the studio. Even the cinnamon sticks. I ran to uh, a supermarket and brought some cinnamon sticks to, uh, as reference one afternoon. Glen Berge, the second of the three single malts, um, centred around the um, customs house, if you remember, and the guard geese. Back in the day, they actually used guard geese uh, to, to protect the property, and they would uh, hiss at you if you tried to come near. And they still are uh, actually at the location in, at this distillery, so they very much wanted to get them in there. And that little fella there is the only photographic piece in the film. It's sort of 99.9% .9 CGI. Um, but we had to deal with uh, honeycomb uh, and pears and citrus. So we modelled the, uh, the customs house um, from a few photographs that we were given from the client. Again, 
fairly low geometry and then the impression of depth um, through Substance Painter, but then in certain scenes we did have to go and model some of the walls with actual geometry when we got in close. I think for the pack shot you'll see in a second. Nothing wrong with going and grabbing stuff and buying stuff. You know, people have already spent time um, scanning and using photogrammetry to create photo real fruit for you. It's widely available, so just buy it. We sat there and said, should we go and do a, a 3D scanning session and get all this? And we're like, well, it's, it's all there. Just buy it. There's no, nothing wrong with that. Um, it's more about this, what you're going to do with it. So we, we put, this was our initial concept for some of the things that would be hanging around the customs house. There was the tax ledgers, because uh, customs house was originally a tax office, and uh, there was tax ledgers, and there was honey oozing out of it, and all the flavor notes were <laughs> contained within it, uh, which I thought looked fantastic, but if the client felt it was zoning in too much on, the, on honey as a, as a flavor, so it was, that creative idea was ditched and swapped out for this concept with these guarded walls around the house that would move like a kinetic sculpture, which is actually a great idea. Um, so we had to model that up as well and work out how to do the ivy. Nice little detail that they actually have this safe in a wall up there at the real location. We borrowed a bit from that, and um, in the corridor leading up to this scene, there's a safe door that opens, which is modelled from that. You'll see here. And the... Uh, pack shot as well with all the flavor notes there and then the final of the uh, the malts was Glen Talkers now this probably was the hardest of the three um, so as we said before they had the pagoda chimneys uh, which is the defining feature of Glen Talkers distillery um, but it's the oldest manual distillery in Scotland or one of and they very much like the idea of these hand-wielded tools, hand-crafted, and, and they wanted uh, brass and old cogs and machinery. At one point, we had a mechanical flower that we created. So we had all these lovely ideas that were going into it. Quite hard to actually put all those things together. Everything started to look quite steampunk. But initially, we modelled the Pagoda chimneys. There wasn't too much problem with that. Um, there are quite a lot of references to pagoda chimneys online you can find and model that fairly simply. The hard part was figuring out what to do with them in this room, in this creative concept. So we had them recessed in the floor. Um, we initially started out with these four florets that were going around it and inside those florets would be some cogs or machinery to articulate this idea of handcrafted distillery. Then we thought maybe it'd be nice if they had little individual sculptures or things, that performance pieces going on on those but that didn't feel right. Went back to florets and said maybe it should be eight and started looking into the design of the uh, the copper piping that would be going on and there was loads more than this. We created loads of Art Deco style layouts for these and then thought maybe should the, should the um, cogs and things be above ground or should they be recessed below ground? Decided to opt that it should be below ground. That felt good. Um, so we started modelling up a bit more detail some of this stuff. Then we chucked some textures on and everything started becoming really distressed and really grungy and that wasn't the right look. Um, this starts to look very ominous and dirty factory and that's not the right look at all. So um, that was a slight problem. Started to move into the scene to get into our sort of modern environment and that helped. We, took, and we also at this point went back and refined some of the textures so they weren't quite so grungy. Started putting some metal plating on top and some girders and things to hide some of the cogs. Then the addition of walkways, that helped a lot because we've got some natural elements in there like wood. And then finally put some uh, softer elements with uh, the uh, heather as around, which helped until we finally got to something we all liked, like this. And the pack shot for that. So that, that's all the, the scenes. Um, when, we, uh, when we're done with all that, or towards the tail end of that, we start using all our models and all our scenes and our assets to repurpose for digital uh, and other, other outputs that they might have, particularly the print assets. Um, and this is where we, we have to go back, perhaps relight the scene, um, certainly render it in much, much higher fidelity, much higher resolution as well. And then these single frames can get retouched in Photoshop and that's how they were used in the final campaign. So our Glen, B Glen Bergie Customs House, relit from a sort of big top light, much more moody lighting. 
completely new fresh angle much higher detail and how it got used in the final campaign here and similarly our beautiful water wheel at Milton Duff and actually this one's probably one of my favourite the way this turned out it's really beautiful and giving it that green colour wash for the print campaign there's so much detail when you sort of stop and look at it all in for a moment and um, how it looked in the final final campaign so I'll start wrapping up a um, little bit of a recap it's a super interesting time like I said at the beginning that, what, that we're able to achieve films like that in, in CGI in, in motion design as I said before is testament to the tools and the talent and everything getting more and more sophisticated every day um, the live action, visual effects, animation, motion design, it's all very, very blurry. And, and the tools are more accessible than ever, um, which I feel is, is what's making the DIY spirit stronger and stronger. Um, you know, you've got all the resources online, uh, tutorials. Insidium earlier, we're talking about their tutorial they're going to put out. And, you know, when I started, that, that stuff wasn't there. And now you can go out and buy a super powerful computer and you can get your subscription monthly subscriptions to it's incredible software and plugins and just make stuff it's it's there's really no excuse much like I was talking earlier when the film side of things changed you can go and get a computer you can get a demo license you can try out these things and then you can start using them so it's exciting to see where it's all going to go next thank you very much